Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here uh, to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. My name is Charlie Wiley. I'm the curator of photography and new media here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. It's my pleasure to and, and uh, privilege to welcome Jana Ireland here today to talk about her work and practice. Um, the uh, way that I came across Jana's work was uh, at the Carolyn Glasso Bailey Foundation in a marvelous exhibition curated by Freddie Janka, who is the executive director of that foundation in Ojai, who is creating a marvelous constellation of exhibitions and installations and plans and everything. And I'm proud to say that Freddie is actually an alum of the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. He used to work here. <laughs> and so uh, he is doing incredible things there. And when I saw the exhibition of Jana's work, I knew that I wanted to acquire some for the uh, museum, for our collection. Um, and the result of that, of the three of the four that we collected, three are on view right now in an exhibition called The Lens of Architecture, Photography, Buildings, and Meaning. And I was just in the gallery with Jana, and it was marvelous to see um, with her. It's always nerve-wracking when a curator uh, goes to look at a at a gallery that you've installed an artist's work in. <laughs> and uh, I was very happy to uh, see that Jana was pleased with the installation. And in fact, uh, it really, that trio of works was the inspiration for the show, which deals with how architecture embodies meanings and uh, can be much more than just uh, bricks and mortar. And that is how uh, Jana has approached this marvelous project that she has done based on the um, architecture of Paul Revere Williams, who was one of the great architects in Los Angeles of the 20th century who gave Southern California its identity and was the first black architect west of the Mississippi to be certified uh, and the uh, first to join the American Institute of Architects. So um, Barbara Bestor at Woodbury University commissioned Jana to do a spectacular survey of uh, Williams' work. And it's not a documentation, it's a, it's a true artist's interpretation. And I don't think I've ever really seen, or very rarely seen, uh, a, a union of two artistic visions like uh, Jana Ireland has approached the work of Paul Revere Williams. It's astounding. And there is a book that you may have seen on the way in that is for sale uh, in the bookstore regarding Paul Williams. And <clears throat> I urge you to at least take a look at it, if not buy your own copy. And the other part of what Jana will be talking about is her work uh, with stage tableau, um, often featuring members of her own family in the tradition of uh, narrative, construction of narrative, identity, place, and um, uh, situations of ambiguous um, and intriguing kinds of familial life and otherwise. Uh, Jana received her um, MFA from UCLA, the Department of Art, and her BFA from New York University Tisch School of the Arts in the Department of Photography and Imaging. She has just been named to be an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Occidental College. Congratulations, that just happened. Um, we're very pleased about that. And, <laughs> and her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, Harper's, uh, et cetera, so many different publications. And her, collect, her work is in the collections of the California African American Museum, the LA County Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Photography, Columbia College, Chicago, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the Woodbury University School of Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Jonna Ireland. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you for coming out today, everyone here in the audience. You heard a little bit about me, and now what I'm going to do is show you some of my work and talk about it, and then at the end, there will be some time for questions. 
So often when I talk about my work, I kind of go in chronological order. But I wanted to begin this talk by talking about, here, I'll take my mask off. Can you hear me a little bit better? Yeah. OK. All right, it's worth it. I'm vaccinated. Okay. Um, I thought I would begin this lecture today by talking about the work that is right here upstairs at the museum and that brought me here today. These are the three photographs that are on view in the Lens of Architecture, the exhibition that Charlie curated. And they're also part of the collection at the museum here. And these three photographs are from a project that I've been working on for six years now on the work of the architect Paul Revere Williams. Charlie told you a little bit about who Williams was. Just to give you a little bit more information, he was born in 1894, he died in 1980, and he ran his own architectural firm from 1923 to 1973, and was credited with designing around 3,000 buildings. And he was able to do all of this as a black architect, much of his career before the Civil Rights Movement, at a time when there were clients who wouldn't sit next to him in his office, or people who would turn around and leave his office when they actually saw the architect and realized that uh, going on the name, they didn't get enough information about who they were visiting that day, and they wanted to work with someone else. So I began this project in 2016, when I was pregnant with my second child and working full time in development at USC. I would work all week and do my long commute in the morning and go home in the evenings. And in all of my spare time, I would be scheduling meetups with people who owned Paul Revere Williams homes or doing research on Paul Revere Williams sites. And it just became this project that grew so much larger than I ever imagined it could and continues to grow, which I will get into a little bit more soon. These three photographs are all from one site. They're from the Hillside Memorial Park and Mausoleum in Los Angeles, which is where Williams lived his whole life and where the majority of his buildings that are still standing are. The whole project, I've been very careful to avoid cars. Cars date a photograph. They say, this has to have been made after this point, for example. But if you look at the version of this photograph that's printed upstairs, you'll see the 405 right here. And you'll see a ton of cars. And that's actually something that I love about this photograph. Because his work is so much about Los Angeles, I love the way you can't avoid looking at Los Angeles when you look at this picture and you see this really essential thing about Los Angeles, the freeway and all the cars that are running through it. So if you are ever on the 405 driving through Culver City, you may see this building. The building that I'm taking the photograph inside of is the, the mausoleum designed by Williams. And this structure right here was also designed by Williams. It's the Al Jolson Memorial. And there's another slide a little bit later that gives a clearer view of that structure. I was just talking to Charlie about the day that I did this work. And Fabian, who works with Charlie, asked if these were all shot in one day. And I said, no, actually. There, are, there were two different times that I visited. The first time I visited, I photographed the Al Jolson Memorial because that's, some, that's public. That's something that you can see from the outside. And then maybe almost three years later, I think, I finally connected with someone who worked at the mausoleum and got permission to go inside and really photograph it in an extensive way. Because people's relatives are buried there, I didn't want to just go in and take photographs and make, make it part of my project. I wanted to make sure that someone knew, that I was do knew what I was doing. This is the cover of the book that was published about this work? Absolutely. Thank you. So after several years of working on this project, I had the opportunity to publish a book of the work that I'd been doing up until this point. Because he worked for so long, that 50 years, and designed 
3,000-ish structures, it felt like a project with no end, something that I could potentially work on forever. And, but the opportunity to publish the book came along. I began to think, is this the end of the project? Is this the end of this phase? Where will the project go next? And then in February 2020, I turned in my materials for the book, thinking that I would continue to work on the project while the book was going through the publication process. But then, of course, everything shut down the next month, and the project remained sort of up in the air for a really long time. I don't have any images from the work that I did during the worst part of the pandemic here, but what actually brought me back to the project was Freddie Jenka from the Carolyn Glasso Bailey Foundation inviting me to photograph a Williams home up in Ojai, which led to me meeting Charlie and me being here today. So one of the things that made Williams successful is that he was able to work in many different architectural styles. It meant that a client who wanted a colonial arrival house or something very modern or something anywhere in between could go into his office and he could sketch something for them that resembled whatever they'd been dreaming of. And working on this project, visiting all of these different kinds of structures, um, part, of, part of my project is comparing all of these different things that he was interested in, all of these different things that he was able to do. These are actually from the same house. So I'm looking pretty formally at shape. I'm looking at light as it's coming in through a window. I'm looking at textures and building materials and trying to photograph his work in a way that looks past, say, carpet or a very distinctive couch or whatever art is hanging on the wall and makes it possible to focus on the craft, focus on his hand and the work that he did. And that's always what I'm trying to do with this work. This is actually from his own house, which I waited for several years to have the opportunity to photograph, and which I will photograph again, maybe later this year when renovations are complete. Curves are something that he's very well known for, the way that he uses curves in his work. This is from his house as well. Oops. Building lots of curves in. You also saw them on that exterior wall. But then I also like to look at the way that he uses lines and angles, too. And here's a closer view of the Al Jolson Memorial there at Hillside Memorial Park. And you can also see the freeway a little bit better in that one, too. This one on the right is from Las Vegas. I'll talk a little bit more about Vada in a minute. And as the project progressed, I also became interested in structures that were destroyed in various ways, structures that didn't survive. For the beginning of the project, I would sort of talk to one person who owned a home, and maybe their friend owned a home, and I would be going from one really pristinely preserved space to another. But then I thought, well, what about this home, which was destroyed in a fire in 1982? And what about this home, which was destroyed by the owner the summer that I took this photograph? In Los Angeles, the fines for destroying a home that you purchase and trying to put up something new are small enough that it's worth it for a lot of people to buy a parcel of land for the land itself, not for the house that's on it. This house once belonged to uh, one of the Gabor sisters, and the facade was knocked off, and then the community around the house was able to halt it. So it existed in this kind of in-between state for a long time where you couldn't live in it, but you couldn't really, um, th there was just nothing to be done with it. I'm not sure what the status of it is today. 
but there is also that dimension to this work. And one of the really interesting things that has happened in the six years that I've been working on this is that more and more people know his name now, and it's becoming harder and harder to get away with something like this. I don't credit myself with doing that. I feel as though I've been kind of rising on this tide of his reputation. The same month that I took my first photographs of buildings designed by him, it was announced that he was being awarded the AIA Gold Medal for 2017. And that meant that I've had that to refer to the whole time I've been working on this project. And that more people that I speak to about the work understand who he is. Every day, it seems, more people are beginning to understand his impact on the city of Los Angeles and on the field of architecture. These are all homes in the Hancock Park neighborhood. I like to do, um, I, I really focus on details in his homes, but then I also like to have these really straightforward views that allow you to see the places where, it, it makes it easier to see all the different styles that he worked in and compare and contrast, see the way that things are a lot alike and see the way that things are similar. The Hancock Park neighborhood is one that he was able to build a lot of his reputation on. When he began his career in the 1920s, Hancock Park was being developed as a place for people to live. And that meant that he could design a house and then someone down the street who had an empty parcel of land could say, I want that architect, or I want a house like that. But he wouldn't have been able to live in this neighborhood. It wasn't desegregated until Nat King Cole bought a house there in the 40s or 50s. And these are from a development that he designed in Rancho Palos Verdes. So these houses are designed to be a lot alike, but to have really individual features. He designed eight different floor plans that could be flipped, so about 16 total, and then you could add different modifications to these floor plans and kind of make the house your own. But they're designed to feel like part of one neighborhood. Feel like, feel cohesive, I should say. Something really fun that's happened with this project is that it is now installed in the Universal City, Studio City uh, Metro Station in LA. I found out that this was happening in December of 2019, and I waited more than two years to be able to tell people about it. And so it just went up last month in June. Oh, another adjustment? OK. Sorry. OK, I will. Um, I will try to tuck it behind my ear or something. Okay. okay. All right. And then something else really exciting that's happened with this work is that right around the same time the book was published in September 2020, I was granted a fellowship by the Nevada Museum of Art to photograph his work there. So I spent the last two years working with the museum. And a week ago, a show of that new work, plus a few photographs that I made of his buildings in Las Vegas in 2018, is up at the museum. Um, so if you are in Nevada in the next few months, this is in Reno now, and it will travel to Las Vegas in December. And now I want to do the chronological thing and kind of jump into talking about the work as it happened. I think that it's when I look at the things that I'm asked to do, the things I've been able to do, I'm always really amazed. So it makes sense to me when I talk about my work to talk about how I got here, because I still can't really believe that I'm here a lot of the time. My dad joined the Army um, out of high school, expecting to be sent to Vietnam. But instead, he was sent to photography school in Germany. And that is how I became a photographer. <laughs> so I grew up in this house with cameras and equipment everywhere. I learned how to use a camera when I was five, but I got serious about it in high school. 
This is one of my very first self-portraits <laughs> when I was 15. No. The camera is made out of an oatmeal container, which is why it, the shadow was warped, because the, the camera was round. And I was a writing major at an arts high school, and I thought that I wanted to write forever, but I had the opportunity to attend a summer program in photography. 20 years ago, I was there. It was the summer of 2002, and working in photography in a really serious way, day after day, away from home, and getting a peek of what college life could be like, and what the life of a visual artist could be like really changed things for me. And after this summer, I decided that I wanted to study photography in college. So here are a few from that summer program in Erie, Pennsylvania. It's very strange to realize that this is 20 years ago, but it was. Another thing that was going on when I was in high school is that I was working on the set of short films directed by my dad's best friend. So I was the photographer, but I was also the script supervisor, and I did makeup and sort of whatever needed to be done. And that's how I became interested in NYU. My dad's best friend right here decided in his 50s to go back to school and to study film. So I was working on his projects for NYU. Through working with him, I found out that NYU had a program for high school students in film. And I applied for that and got in. And on Saturday mornings, I would take the first train from Philadelphia to New York up to this film program at NYU. And that's how I ended up deciding to study there in college. There's my dad back there, by the way. I did think I wanted to do film for a while because thinking about film, thinking about photography, thinking about writing, what I'm really interested in is telling stories. But working on these film sets, I realized that I wanted to work by myself, that I couldn't work with a whole crew, that I had too many things to figure out about myself and the way I worked to be trying to direct other people. And that photography was a way to tell stories to use a really visual medium in a way that was comfortable for me and that made sense for me. And then I graduated and I moved to New York. And I studied photography at NYU for four years. This is one of the very first photographs that I took when I moved to New York in Union Square Park. As I was beginning my time in school, I thought that what I wanted to do was be a street photographer and photograph life as it was and be walking around and finding things as a photographer. I would do things like photograph plays, which is something that's still really fun for me. I would photograph strangers. It's sort of a, an exercise in making myself more comfortable in the world, asking a stranger if I can take their photograph. But then I began experimenting with light and experimenting with constructing my own scenes. And that really clicked for me. I found it to be an absolutely magical process. And that meant, again, making up my own stories and telling them instead of trying to tell someone else's stories. Here are some very early experiments with light. And that's me, of course, an early self-portrait. I was also doing things like making comics as a way to bring language into photography, sort of something between writing and film and, and 
mostly working in photography. I, it's something that um, I'm still really interested in. I have to find the right story and figure out how I want to tell it. But I think as a form, it's really striking using photography this way. This is from a comic called Prospect Park, about where I lived in Brooklyn at the time. And I was also interested in photographing myself, but sort of didn't really know how to begin to do it. In my senior year, I took a self-portrait class where I did two projects. And one of them was this one called A Life in Pictures. The idea behind this work is that at any given time, walking around New York City, you could be in the background of a stranger's photograph. This project was, let's see, this must have been very early 2007. Yeah, okay, this was January 2007, and the iPhone was released in June or July of that year. So as soon as I finished this project, the world changed, and it became even more possible to be in the background of strangers' photos and just be, um, I don't know, be a, a character that shows up when people look at their pictures and, and think about things that they did. So I was using this work also to talk about tourism in New York. This is outside of the Brooklyn Museum. There I am in here, the video store. This couple, these were strangers, but years later I made friends with a couple um, when I was living in Eugene, Oregon, and it turned out that they were friends with this couple. So they got to see the photograph. So they were kind of, they'd forgotten that it happened, and it was kind of the reverse situation where they were in the background of my, my picture, but they ended up finding out about it, which I think is really amazing. This is the Met, the lobby of the Met. The lobby of the old Whitney building. Prospect Park again. Union Square Park. Actually, that was Washington Square Park. This is Union Square Park. Lincoln Center. This was Times Square during Fleet Week, which was when all of the ships come in to the city and the soldiers get off and party. The sailors, I guess you would say. The restaurant from Seinfeld. The Statue of Liberty as seen from the Staten Island Ferry. Central Park. The Brooklyn Bridge and my graduation from NYU. <laughs> and this is how it was presented as four by six photographs, which before the iPhone was how people were mostly looking at their photographs. At the same time I was doing that, I was also beginning to make photographs about domestic life. I'd moved into an apartment with my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, and I started making these pictures at home as a way to begin to get comfortable photographing myself in these really staged scenarios. Up until this point, my senior year, I hadn't really felt comfortable making this kind of work. I'd felt really outside of what was going on in the department. But then I took this class, which was with underclassmen I didn't know and with people who were non-majors, and I suddenly felt able to begin to make this work that I'd been thinking about for a long time. And the final format of that was these little books. Several years later, I was living in Eugene, Oregon with my husband who was in graduate school. And I'd been feeling really burned out, and maybe like I wouldn't go back to school. I had, um, let's see, about almost $200,000 in student loan debt. So I always had to have a full-time job, and it never seemed practical to go back to school. 
but watching my husband in his creative writing MFA program and watching him interact with his classmates and have these really intense conversations about the work they were doing and the writing they were interested in and what moved them about a particular author, I wanted that for myself. And I uh, began a new body of work, which I then used to apply to graduate school. And that was this work. I applied to several schools, and I ended up getting into UCLA, which was my first choice. And I got to move down to LA and kind of begin my relationship with the city, which led to that work that I showed you at the beginning. So, Los Angeles. I moved to LA and I was interested in the city as a place, but also just kind of figuring out being an art student and figuring out concentrating on my work in a serious way that I hadn't been able to since that summer that I talked about, the summer of 2002. I worked all the way through college, so I wasn't able to do internships. I wasn't a part of department life and I couldn't focus on the work the way I wanted to. So graduate school became an opportunity to do that. And here are some photographs from a body of work about West Hollywood, which was where I lived at the time. When Barbara Bester, who Charlie mentioned, is the person who commissioned me to do the Williams work, invited me to do it, I thought, I make portraits, I make self-portraits, I make work about people. I don't know anything about photographing buildings. But then when I looked through my work, I found this. And I found other bodies of work where there were already hints that I was interested in architecture and the built environment. And that gave me the courage to say yes and figure out how to do the Williams work. At the same time I was doing things like photographing West Hollywood, I was also making photographs at my husband's grandfather's house in Encino, another place where architecture was really sneaking in. My husband's grandfather lived in this enormous house um, that once had seven people living in it, him and his wife and their five children. And at the time that I moved to Los Angeles and began photographing it, it was just my husband's grandfather who lived there. So I became interested in it as kind of a set, a place I could return to again and again, and things would be the same, that had a bunch of different areas to explore, and that was a way to really look at things that were very symbolic of Los Angeles and Southern California. There was a swimming pool and a tennis court and an orange grove and all of these things that really represented LA to me. And this work became my thesis in graduate school. So it's a mix of portraits of me in this space, pretending that I'm the person who lives in this grand house, and then photographs of the house itself and of, the, of everything surrounding the house. I won't really get into it, but I was looking a lot at painting and the way that symbolism is used in painting and the way that a particular piece of fruit can mean a particular thing. Oranges, for example, can mean purity. Strawberries mean something different and grapes mean something else. And also looking at gesture and the way that it's used in painting and trying to make my gestures in these photographs are really deliberate, as though they were painted. This photograph was, I think, the first photograph of mine that was collected by an institution. 
um, when I finished school, I got a grant, a grant, a, um, what would you call it? I guess it was a grant from the museum at Columbia College in Chicago. And they purchased this and another photograph, which was an enormous confidence boost at a time when I was getting out of graduate school and just completely terrified of what would happen afterwards. I felt like I was building this community in LA and I finally understood a way that I could fit into the art world. But we had to move back to New York for three years for my husband to go to law school. There he is. And this was the other photograph that the museum purchased. This piece is the centerpiece of this, um, I guess I call them altar pieces. This is about 100 inches wide. I'll show you how it works. It opens and closes. And I made a few of these when I was in school, but they're very difficult to figure out what to do with because in a museum or gallery, no one is supposed to touch the art, but the whole point of these is that you're supposed to touch them. So fast forward a few years, we spent our time in New York. Uh, my first son was born while we were still living there and my husband was still in law school. And then we moved back to Los Angeles and I began making work at my husband's grandfather's house again. And this time I was looking at the way my children interacted with the space. For me, it was this really foreign place where I was trying to fake my way into feeling comfortable, but for my children, it was something that was always part of their lives. And here in the background is a photograph from the original project. So it's a, a sequel, you could say. And in this work, I'm revisiting a lot of the same places. So there's that swimming pool peeking out in the background and revisiting some of the symbols of the original work and trying to disrupt them or look at them differently. This photograph and the last photograph, by the way, I took at home at night after my children went to sleep because it became very difficult to get to my husband's grandfather's house and make these photographs when he was in his late 90s and I had young children and a full-time job. So I had to find ways to keep making the work, even when I couldn't get where I really wanted to be. <clears throat> and then the pandemic again. <laughs> so in that period where the work I was doing about Paul Williams was kind of in question, and I was at home all the time. I began photographing myself and my children at home, kind of as we actually were, as opposed to this fantasy version of ourselves where the lighting is perfect and the clothing is perfect and the house is perfect. It focused primarily on my children, but as I kept working on it, it became important to me to kind of show myself a little bit as the person who was looking at these children, as the person who was with these children all day. How are we doing on time? I go very, I talk very fast sometimes. 2.45. Okay, we're perfect, all right. Thank you. And this is work that I'm still doing. We've moved to a different house, but it still feels, um, it 
still feels important to me. And it was really exciting for me to figure out a way to photograph my children as they are. I think that the Paul Williams work made it easier for me to do that because that work is so much about spontaneity. It may look very still and very planned, but that work is me going into a completely unfamiliar place and trying to make photographs of it. And I guess the abilities that I gained through doing that, through learning how to do that, allowed me to be spontaneous at home. And several of these photographs are up at a show that is at a, a satellite gallery that LACMA runs at Charles White Elementary. So if you're in LA for the next, uh, in the next couple of Saturdays, the show is up for a little bit longer. Here you can see some of the little sculptures I've been making more recently, I'm trying to solve the problem that I talked about when I showed you that large piece of wanting people to touch it, but them not being allowed to. I wanted to create work where you could move around in space and that would do the changing for you. So here's one of those. Please forgive my wobbly video. But. And here are just a few more views from the show, which also includes work by artists like Zora J. Murph, Danielle Bowman, and Leslie Hewitt. And here are those photographs from Rancho Palos Verdes installed in the gallery, which includes work from four of my bodies of work, which is something I'm still not really, uh, haven't fully processed, I guess. And more recently, I've been doing work with my grandmother's archives, with her pictures. So these are some recent works that I made in the darkroom. I'm still trying to figure these out, but I'm really excited about them. And I'm excited about the possibility of continuing to work with this material. And here's my messy studio right now. And I think that is the end of my presentation. I can take questions now. Thank you. Yes. Okay, those are both excellent questions. So Julia Shulman, for those of you who don't know, was a photographer who worked mostly on the West Coast and photographed a lot of architecture, including a lot of architecture by Paul Revere Williams. And they were actually friends. So his work came up again and again in my research on architectural photography and in my research on Williams and his projects. And it's work that I love and appreciate but not work that I'm trying to recreate. It's kind of always there in the back of my mind, but what I'm trying to do is take these little pieces of a place and put them together to contribute to a larger portrait of the architect. And what Shulman was doing was making photographs, mostly for commercial purposes, which means here's a picture of this room. If you purchase this house, if you hire this architect, this is what you could get. So the aims of his work were different, I think. And for the second question regarding soft portraits, there are several different ways that I've made them. The earliest ones were made with um, one of the old plunger, uh, what are they called? Oh my goodness, cable releases, where you kind of press the button or where you squeeze the bulb to take the photograph on a film camera. 
Um, for a while, when I switched to digital, I didn't have any kind of remote, so I would just set the timer and run away from the camera <laughs> as fast as I could. Um, photographs like the one where I'm on the diving board in the swimming pool, I didn't want to have the remote over the water, and I was too far away to run across, of course, so my husband was taking the photograph, and he's actually the stand-in as I'm setting up lights, so there are lots of photographs of him on his phone um, in the locations that those photographs are set in. And let's see, other ways that I've done them, I work a lot with a remote, and then some of the ones that you saw of me and my children are done through the computer. So I'll set up the camera and then set up the computer and tether the camera to the computer so my children can see themselves on the, ca on the computer screen and react to themselves, which is also a way that I've made self-portraits for publications. I did a photograph for The New Yorker that was of my hand, but I had to use a lens that where the focus was so tight that there was no way to get my hand in the right place if I weren't behind the camera. So I had to be able to position it exactly. Or a photograph I did for The Atlantic where I had to be an exact distance from the camera. So working with the computer and tethering is um, something that I am really intrigued by now and continuing to explore. Yes? When we're looking at your pictures of architecture, how, how much of what we're seeing is about you as the artist, and how much of it is about the architect whose work you're trying to provide a, a picture of? My position is that it's always about the architect. But the truth is that it has to be about me, that it's always filtered through me, and that if you went to any of these places with or without a camera, you would have a completely different experience of it. So it's, it's impossible to extract me from this work. And me being the person who did it, I don't have enough distance from it to talk about it. Um, I don't know, to talk about it only as his work because, for example, this was Rancho Palos Verdes and if I were going to talk about this, I wouldn't be able to help telling you that it was trash day and I had to move all of the trash bins to take the pictures and then put them back. Or, you know, this house, I actually took a picture of it from across the street just to add it to one of those big grids and the owner saw me and invited me in and I ended up photographing the whole house. So those stories are so tied up in every image for me, and I don't know how much of it you can see when you look at them, but I certainly feel it. Yes? Do you know if the homes or any of these buildings are now being considered like heritage sites, or is the city trying to preserve them in any way so they don't get remodeled or destroyed like we saw some of your other, you have some shots like that? It is difficult to determine what to preserve. The work, there's so, there's so much volume. There's so much of it, and so much of it has been really altered that a lot of it comes down to how much the neighborhood cares or how much the homeowner cares. The home that he lived in with his wife and children before he designed a home for himself has recently acquired landmark status in LA but nobody knows what to do with it. It's just kind of sitting there, um, safe, but not, um, not, nothing's being done with it. So there are, I don't know, it's such a huge project to look at his work. And there are enough pretty significant sites that are well taken care of that I think there will always be some that get away. Yes. I noticed that some of your color things were on site. And what sorts of your themes? Uh, how do you make that personal? So for the photographs that you saw of West Hollywood, and for some other photographs that I've made at night, one of the things I love about Los Angeles is the way light is used and the way uh, buildings or gas stations are designed to be seen from far away. So photographing those in black and white uh, makes it possible to really just look at the light itself and the way it's being used without having to consider color. 
And then with the Williams work, because there's such a huge spread in terms of decades and styles, photographing in black and white is a way to unify all of that work as well as make it possible to, like I think this wall is gold or something like that, or green. It's a, it's a really um, conspicuous color. And photographing in black and white means that I can focus more closely on the architecture itself. And also ignore color temperature. So a lamp can be on in a room and there can be light coming in through the window and I don't have to deal with the tungsten bulb from the lamp mixing with the daylight coming in through the window. And all the light fits together really neatly. Okay, someone, there was another question right there, and then I'll kind of <laughs> jump around. Yes? Okay. Um, I was curious how, how did you find time to make work for such a construction? Oh, it was incredibly difficult. <laughs> Um, and it's, I didn't talk, uh, Charlie mentioned that I just uh, got a job at Occidental, a full-time job. But what I was doing for a while was working full-time, driving home for an hour, picking the kids up, teaching night classes at Pasadena City College, and then still doing shoots on the weekend. And it was, it was just impossible. Um, so for that period of time before it became possible to leave that full-time job, I was just figuring out whatever I could. I mean, it was, I'm not entirely sure how I did it, but <laughs> it was important to me to do it. I couldn't, I found that as a parent, I couldn't be good at it if I weren't also doing this thing for myself. I couldn't just go to work and then come home and be with the kids all the time. I had to be doing this, this thing. I had to be making my own work just for my own personal satisfaction. And then I just got lucky that other people became interested in it too. Yes, OK. Yes, sir. I think, I think you were the next person I saw with your hand up. That is a super interesting question that I will continue to think about after I figure out how to answer it. But um, <laughs> I think, oh gosh. One thing that we have in common, we both had a teacher in high school tell us not to pursue the work we wanted to do. <laughs> Williams had a teacher say, you know, a black architect can't succeed. There won't be enough people to actually hire you. You should be a doctor or lawyer because the black community always needs doctors or lawyers. And I had a teacher tell me that people from humble beginnings don't have any business applying to places like NYU. And I almost didn't apply. But when I um, began to do research about him, I was able to connect to his story in that way, but also in thinking about how entirely different things are for me and how they're so different for me because of people like him and the work that he did. But then I did have this whole project of writing to these people with incredible amounts of money and saying, can I come sneak around your house for an afternoon and make pictures? And I still don't really I just kind of did it. I mean, I, I wanted to make the work. I was so intrigued by Williams' story that I, I did it, and it became easier every time. And what I found was that the people who understood what they had, which was, as I went on and on, became everyone, were really open to the work and were really proud of what they had and wanted to see what I would do with it. So I don't, I, I, I'm going to keep thinking about it. Uh, did that answer it kind of enough to be satisfying? Mm -hmm. We'll take one okay. last question. Yes. Hi. Thank Hi. You. Um, I'll ask, I have a two-parter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I was looking at trying to go to Hills. I, I would love to do a bit of a tour. 
Aura on my own whenever, like not in people's houses, but just to look at your work and see the real thing. So as well as the hillside, the Aldorf Memorial. Are there other places you would recommend that, like, hey, if you're interested in this, go here, go there, like as a start for a journey? Hillside is a really good one because it's very pandemic friendly mm -hmm. and it's more difficult to get into sites that I would recommend like um, Founders Memorial, Founders Memorial, Founders Church in um, Koreatown in LA. Um, it is, it's just been kind of closed down and it's very difficult to get into. What are some others that would be good to visit? My work in Las Vegas has been really exciting. Las Vegas, Reno, Central Nevada. Um, there, it seems like there are more places that are accessible to the public that I've actually photographed there than there are in Los Angeles. This is in Las Vegas, by the way. Um, okay, let me think a little bit more. Other recommendations in LA. Oh, one of them is Solstice Canyon, which is the house that burned down in 1982. It's up in Malibu. You kind of park down at the bottom of a big hill, and then you can walk up and see the remains of the house. The homeowners sold it to, I guess, the city of Malibu. It, it's somehow government-owned, so the, the burned-out site is preserved, and it's a place that you can visit. And that is, yeah. I'm really fascinated by the intersection of your, your own journey writing, and the film work, and the photography. But most of all, when you think about your storytelling, and you want to start a new series, like you, you really pivoted in a nice way with your family like during the pandemic. Do you kind of just look for clues? Or like, how did that come up for you? And how did what, which part come the, up? The sort of how you're developing the story you're telling. Hmm. I think it's kind of different every time. I mean, the Williams work and the story that I tell about that came out of, came out, well, came out of the commission, exactly. It came out of someone I knew passing my name along to someone else, and that led to this. But then it will, sometimes, I will just come up with a question on my own or something else that I want to look at, and it, it really varies. Um, I'm really interested in location, obviously, and in architecture. And maybe it doesn't vary as much as I think. I mean, I, it feels like there is a really consistent set of preoccupations, and that I'm just looking at them from a slightly different way every time. I'm always interested in family and in familial sites and in architecture. And I'm always interested in light. I'm always interested in gesture. And I think if you laid all of these bodies of work out on a big table, that you'd be able to. It's like your ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. Really I, really like I think Thank so. You. So I don't know if that, did that sort of answer yeah. the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is that the last one? Yeah. Are we allowed to take any more? Okay. Okay. sometime in your future, you've said it way in the past that you have thought about writing, um, you know, the backstory on a lot of these things, like, you know, taking the picture and then the people inviting you in. Do you see a time when you might write your own, write your journey instead of, uh, or in addition to the photography? Because that is unique. Um, Thank you. The way you tell that story. I've done a little bit of it, and in the book, there is an essay that I wrote that's a little bit about Williams, but mostly about how I came to the work and how I actually did the work. Um, I did some writing for a magazine during the pandemic about the work that I was doing at the time, but it still feels, I think because I gave writing in a serious way up when I left high school, my writing still feels very adolescent to me. I mean, I'm married to someone with an MFA in creative writing, and a lot of our friends are writers. So it's something that I love and that I can do relatively easily, but that I still, I feel like I haven't worked on it enough. I feel like when I, when I read something 
that is amazing. It makes me want to write, but then I think maybe that's not the way that I'm supposed to be telling stories. Maybe telling them visually is what I should be focusing on, and that I should just be happy that I have another way to do it. So I've sort of done it a little bit. Maybe more will come. We'll see what I have time to do, what people ask me to do. Uh, we're through with John's work. Thank you again.